Good morning. How the devil are you doing this fine day? Weren't we all here like a few hours ago? Uh, this morning you find me bemused, confused and amused in roughly equal measure. The Scotland and Northern Ireland region of the NFDC met recently and as is often the case, I was mentioned in dispatches. That mention suggested that my radio show only has 200 to 300 listeners. So for those 200 to 300 people, and for the record, demolitionnews.com has more than 64,000 subscribers who each receive my weekly email newsletter, as well as being updated five days a week with this very daily show. We have another 18,000 followers on Facebook and another 9,000 on LinkedIn. We also have 140,000 followers on Instagram. This show is also broadcast live on the Diggers and Dozers page on Facebook, where we have another 238,000 followers. And one of our recent videos just racked up 44 million views across uh, both Facebook and uh, and Instagram. Sorry. In addition, in addition to that, uh, last night's After Dark show was viewed live by almost 2,000 people. In fact, a number of NFDC members took part in the show, including the recent or the current rather Northwest Regional Representative and a former vice president in fact that a former vice president actually won our brock giveaway i have to be honest i'm not particularly bothered about the uh, underestimating my reach but i do wonder if the scottish region of the nfdc is rather missing the point when eight members of their federation have already admitted involvement in a 150 million pound bid rigging scandal that has brought the entire industry into disrepute and they're giving up chunks of their regional meeting to talk about me I'm surprised they bother, given the belief that my audience is a few hundred people. Weird, right? And while we're on the subject of my reach, earlier today I received a list of the companies and organisations that have sought me out on LinkedIn during the past week. Bam Nuttall. No great surprise, they're in construction. Lang O'Rourke. Sure, why not? Brown and Mason. Absolutely predictable. And then, in the number four position, the United Nations. Wonder what that's all about. Now, without further ado, let me roll the intro, get uh, post the question of the day, which in this instance relates very much to one of our regular viewers. And let's get this show on the road. Welcome to the Breakfast Show. I'm your host, Mark Anthony. Let me just address the elephant in the room. Yes, I am wearing a shirt. Yes, I have a meeting later. It'll be back to T-shirts and scruffy shorts tomorrow, I promise. Um, Now, uh, it is Thursday, the 18th of August, and as that remarkably persistent and remarkably well-dressed person just said, welcome to The Breakfast Show. I am your host, Mark Anthony. In today's show, uh, demolition swings to the rescue after a building collapse in America. HE Services digs into history, and there's girl power at Ward Demolition in New Zealand. Plus, we're going to give you another chance to see our exclusive interview with Richie Brothers' uh, Johan Lustig as we discuss the present and future for electrically powered equipment. And we'll get to all of that in just a second. But first, let's see who among the rich and the shameless will be celebrating a birthday on this day of days. Happy birthday! And it's many happy returns to Poseidon Adventure actress Shelley Winters and to disgraced movie director Roman Polanski. Happy birthday also to movie icon Robert Redford, to American comedian Dennis Leary and to actor Christian Slater. But far and more, far more importantly, today marks the birthday of one of the finest actors of his generation. The star of Fight Club, Primal Fear, Motherless Brooklyn and perhaps most importantly American History X. Actor Mr Edward Norton. Many happy returns to them one and all. So, you know, there's something of a lobby against the entire demolition process at the moment. How demolition wastes embodied carbon. How demolition should be outlawed in favour of refurbishment. As I said on yesterday's show, we shouldn't forget that one of the key reasons for demolition's very existence is to sort out the problems created by short-sighted architects and developers that create buildings that, for one reason or another, do not stand the test of time nor progress. Oh, and by the way, which industry sector do you think they turn to when things go awry and people get injured? 
Good evening. Once again, efforts are underway to demolish the Park Avenue building that collapsed Friday in Herkimer. News Channel 2's Ben Kinney spent the afternoon in Herkimer and spoke with the village's fire chief about the future of other deteriorating buildings in the village. Ben, good evening. Good evening, Jason and Kristen. Herkimer Fire Chief Mike Moody says that a plan is already in the works to address other deteriorating buildings in the village and that this story could have had a very different ending. It was the end of an era in Herkimer this afternoon as crews began the demolition process of a 122-year-old Park Avenue building. The building collapsed on Friday afternoon, injuring a woman whose car was crushed by falling debris. According to Herkimer Fire Chief Mike Moody, the story could have been much different. Any commercial building like that, four-story building along the public way, the sidewalk, parking lot, residential building on the other side of it, if the collapse was any worse than it was, um, there was a chance that it could have been much more serious than it was. Village officials decided not to enter into a shared service agreement with the city of Utica, instead opting to use an outside contractor, Utica-based Ritter and Paratory Contracting, to demolish the building, a process Chief Moody says will take several weeks to complete. Uh, the mayor and the village board of trustees chose to do a total demolition and a cleanup, so basically when Ritter Paratory is done, the site will be clean and graded. Um, the initial estimates we got as far as a time frame are somewhere between four and five weeks to complete everything. The building was one of many in the village of Herkimer in a state of disrepair, which Chief Moody says isn't a problem seen only in Herkimer. However, a new plan is in the works with the village board that may soon address these issues. There are buildings in the community that obviously because of content load occupancy type, age, things like that are deemed a higher risk than others. Um, so that, and that's, that's inherent to every community. Um, I believe the village is in the process of developing some sort of a plan um, to deal with some of the things that need to be uh, dealt with sooner rather than later. So we'll just have to, uh, re it remains to be seen what they come up with and how they move forward with that. Now we do have an update on the condition of the woman who was injured in the collapse. Officials report that she has been released from the hospital, but had no other information on her condition. Jason? If architects really do want to outlaw demolition, then maybe, just maybe, they need to build better buildings. We're travelling back in time next. Uh, so let's fire up the DeLorean, crank her up to 88 miles, of, uh, uh, 88 miles per hour, and let's get all Marty McFly. At 10.50am on the 6th of November 1944, a German V2 rocket was fired from The Hague in the occupied Netherlands. Just a few minutes later, that rocket landed on the town of Yalding in Kent. The impact damaged 100 homes in the village, and six people were injured. But by the grace of God and sheer good fortune, there was no loss of life. And now, 78 years after that fateful day, the search is on for the remains of that V2 rocket. Intensive investigations by the team at Research Resource Archaeology have led to a large back garden in Yelding. An electronic survey of the garden has shown a number of possible finds just waiting to be discovered. This site particularly interests the team for many reasons, but mainly because the recorded crater size of 20 metres is double the average size for that kind of impact. Hoping to discover why the crater is so big, the archaeological team will put all the information found into a study that will be submitted to Kent County Council's Historic Environment Manager and will form a fantastic historic contribution to the history of Yalding. Work on this important archaeological dig is being aided by a Komatsu excavator that has been loaned to the dig team by the fine folks at HE Services. Now that dig is going on as we speak and it's open to the public. You can find out more about the dig and about how the deadly V2 rocket actually contributed positively to the space race using the link in the chat or in the show description. 
and you can also follow progress over on Twitter by following at Crater Locators. Massive thanks to Sean Bostwick and the team at HE Services for sharing this with us. That was a quick tr- change of tops, wasn't it? Uh, hats off to the team at HE Services for the loan of that machine for this important archaeological dig. Having done a John O'Groats to Land's End run with HE Services founder Hugh Edlianu back in the late 1980s, I always have a bit of a soft spot for that company. Just a very quick reminder, if you'd like to find out more about that historic dig, please just use the link in the chat. The Miller GT Series heralds a new era of unrivaled power and cutting-edge intelligent coupler technology, increasing job site safety, machine versatility and productivity. It's the added versatility that you need at the value you can afford. To find out more, visit millergroundbreaking.com. Despite question marks about my reach and influence here in my native UK, Demolition News is known across the entire demolition world. Now, you might recall that we featured New Zealand company Ward Demolition a while back as they tackled the Pigeon Palace. Well, they were so pleased to have been featured on the show that they've now sent us another example of their work. I'm Bailey Ward. I've been one of the operators here on the Mercury power station. We've been working here for about a month now and we've just finished stage one. I'm quite excited about this job for the recycling rates. We always aim to recycle as much as we can from the building. The structure is mainly made out of concrete and steel so I think we can get in the high 90s. All of the concrete here on site will be recycled into the foundations. The metal gets loaded into trucks and sent to our local scrapyards, where 100% of it is recycled. Yeah, my name's Chris Tyus. I look after the uh, Southdown uh, power generation plant for Mercury. It's particularly tricky for wards at the moment because we're working in a live site. So we've allocated certain sections for them. They've been on the wet surface hair condenser, which is the cooling towers of the site. They were working within about three meters of live 11,000 volt cables. They're working particularly close to Transpower Switchyard and to a Kiwi Rail Transformer which is sensitive to dust, vibration, and also minimum approach distances and contact with the heavy machinery. Any dust particles or ions and stuff in the air can cause a track, and if there's a fault, it can short the equipment out, trip the gear, and uh, we're on the network between Anderson and Otahu. So if we cut those services off, then it causes major problems for Transpower. We hope to finish the job at the end of the year or the first quarter uh, 23. Hi, I'm Friday. I've been working for Ward Demolition for 20 years now, and I really love my job, and I love the people that I work with. The first stage, it was pretty cool pulling down the water sack. It was quite heavy, so we needed two 50-ton diggers to achieve the lifts. The fans were huge, and um, just had to have a bit of control with the machine and get it to the ground safely. Tracking the heavy machinery around site is a bit of a challenge because there's underground water tanks, and we've got to be mindful of those. It can easily give way and cause a bit of damage to the machines and ourselves. and whoever's around but everything came to plan love the project so far i'm going to see this right to the end hello i am tyler ward managed to chip our way through stage one with two 50 ton diggers and two 20 ton diggers we have left the wall to stay up because behind that is 
a whole lot of live cables and we just want to protect that while we do our demolition. Any of our vibrations or even cutting up this big steel pipe, it was setting alarms off in the station so we had to cut it by hand so it doesn't vibrate or make as much noise. This back area is going to work as a bit of a lay down area for the rest of the demolition. We're moving on to some chillers and auxiliary boilers next, but there's certain cables that have to be shut off before we continue our demolition. Uh, massive congratulations on a job well done. It's great to see a female member of the Ward family front and centre of the operation, not as a woman in a man's world, but just as a demolition worker. Absolutely top job. Um, I'm not going to hark on about this for much longer, but um, given question marks about our reach, we have a viewer uh, on board from Singapore this morning. Morning, Paul. Uh, Paul is a fantastic high-reach operator. Um, a lot of people here may already know him. Uh, he's certainly been around the business. Uh, he is a hired gun, travels the world, uh, operating um, high-reach excavators. He spent a bit of time down uh, under in um, New Zealand, I think, also in Australia. I think he's been to the Falklands as well, uh, spent a bit of time up in Norway as well. So, uh, yeah, he is a, a very sought-after guy. Fantastic to have him on the show. Thank you very much indeed for joining us today, uh, Paul. And give my regards to Singapore. <laughs> If you were watching last night's After Dark show, and I know many of you were, uh, you would have already seen the film that I'm about to play you. Uh, it features an interview with Johan Lustig of Ritchie Brothers, in which he and I discuss electric machines, their life expectancy, and their likely resale value. I make no apologies for replaying this film on today's show. If you'll pardon the pun, our electric machine film sparked... Uh, sorry, sparked a huge amount of debate last night. In fact, the discussion probably accounted for about half of last night's show. Uh, the film is about six minutes long, and I fully understand if you can't stick around, particularly if you've already seen it, but we will be hopping over into the chat just as soon as this is finished. I hope to see you there. So, here's Johan. There has been a lot of talk and debate online recently about electrically powered construction equipment. While equipment manufacturers are keen to convince us all that electric power is a solution to at least some of our environmental challenges, Others, potential customers included, still have questions about things like expected battery life, charging times, and the amount of work that can be carried out on a single charge. But perhaps the biggest question that still hangs over electric machines is their likely resale value. With equipment manufacturers either unable or unwilling to help answer that most pressing question, we reached out to auction house Ritchie Brothers to find out what they were seeing in terms of electric machine sales. Electrical equipment is such a new equipment and Ritchie Brothers mainly deals with used equipment. Hence, it needs to go a couple of years before we actually see that through our systems in, in the normal case. So what we've been now, now we've been observing the market as a full. We, we're looking at new sales and starting to prepare where we see new sales are high. So we are already in those regions. So that kind of answers my second question, which was going to be, have you seen a good demand for electric machines? I guess it's it's still too early. I, I'm, I, I'm trying to, I've been trying to remember, I think we've had electric machines around for what, four or five years now? Yeah, it depends on the, we need to differentiate a bit. Electric machinery is quite common. We, we've been using it for a hundred years almost, especially in mines, but then it has been cable driven machines. So that that's the first real electrical equipment still available. And what's, what's happening now is that we transition from uh, cable-driven machines into different or other versions, like hybrid versions with a, with a cable and a battery, or pure battery, or, or battery hydrogen, or, or uh, diesel cable, and all these hybrids that's coming into the market. One of my other questions is going to be, um, are customers seeking assurance on on battery condition obviously that's a another new question if you haven't been selling any um electrically powered uh, construction equipment as yet it's probably too easy to uh, too early to ask but at the same time I mean, you've mentioned mining equipment i guess you've you've had a fair few electric forklifts go across the uh, across the way yes. over the years as well yeah the thing is with forklifts they use a totally different battery type than what we see in in the modern like construction equipment excavators uh, loaders and so on because forklifts still depend heavily on having a good counterweight most of them or the weight is usually not an issue uh, even though the counterweight might not be needed in this uh, 
uh, I don't know the English word for it, but you, uh, you have this counterweight forklift and then you have warehouse forklifts where you usually have support legs on them. But uh, still, weight is not an issue. And then you go for the cheapest battery normally, which is still is lead acid batteries. And that is the main, uh, main battery types in the material handling sectors. There are cases where we see lithium batteries in that sector as well, but then it's because you need the, the possibility to do a quick charge, which lead acid doesn't. It's very clear. I think this is one of those questions that I'm probably about two years too early to, <laughs> to yeah. actually be asking. But it's, it really is responding to a, a genuine request. We, we've had, funny enough, we've had a discussion on, on the show this morning about that very thing, you know, about... Um, we have one of our audience has been reaching out to various equipment manufacturers, including Hitachi and JCB, asking about potential resale values and battery life and all that kind of thing. And they're not that they either can't or they won't give him an answer at the moment. Um, and maybe it is as simple as they actually don't have an answer yet. Yeah, we actually did a huge effort in the beginning of this year, me and my team here, we, we, we reached out to all our good contacts in the construction business to get our heads around this new equipment type when it comes to battery electric, if we talk about just battery electric, which is the main subject, and 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 had a thorough discussion. I think we, we talked with at least 10 uh, importers or OEMs uh, of this. We also talked to some battery producers and, and so on to compile a good report that we then sell to finance customers and, and other uh, interested in the subject. And uh, if we talk about battery life, it's, it's we, we can look a bit on, on uh, batteries for electric buses. It's still not the same chemistry as the ones that are in, in uh, electric construction machines, but they, they hold some of the same properties. And so far, we've seen that eight years has not been a great issue for these batteries. But most manufacturers say that you will see a battery replacement somewhere around year eight to ten. That, that's the consensus we've seen so far. And year eight to ten... It I mean, certainly here in the UK, we, we are a very rental-driven um, sector. Eight to ten years is at least, well, it's, it's probably two working lives. I, I would imagine most of the, these machines would have, have been through the fleet and put, put back out again after about four or five years, if not even less than that. Yeah, so for the first owner, I guess that won't be much of an issue. But also when you consider the, the, the life of diesel machines today, it's heavily regulated due to exhaust requirements, euro zones for engines and so on, that won't be for, for electric machines because they, they don't have any pollution. So they are unaffected by these regulations. Also, technically, it's if you look at the chassis, don't, don't talk about the battery, but if you look at the chassis and, and the functions within the chassis, electric machines are actually quite a lot simpler than, than the diesel version. So all of this speaks for that the electric machines will actually be able to be in, in life for a longer time than a diesel version. In a diesel excavator, you have a diesel engine, uh, which is quite complicated. Uh, and that powers a, a, a hydraulic pump, which uh, powers then all the rest of the machinery inside uh, the excavator, tracks, digging, uh, cylinders, and so on. Uh, when you do it in, in a battery electric, you actually have a electrical engine powering the same pump, which is a lot <laughs> simpler than a diesel engine. And then you uh, usually exchange the, the counterweight to the battery. Uh, so the machine itself becomes quite simple. Uh, and we also see in some examples, Volvo did a test a couple of years ago with a fluid-free excavator where you replaced all the hydraulics with, with mini electrical servos instead to handle all of this. That hasn't gone into production, but there, there are takes on this that might mm, cause the electrical machines to, to be simpler and, and uh, longer living. Yeah, thank you very much indeed once again to Johan Lustig for taking the time to speak to me. At extremely short notice, he literally had about three hours to prepare for that. Uh, and thanks to our friend for, uh, Peter Haddock for helping making that interview happen. Uh, I think it's tempting to see Richie Brothers as um, fast-talking auctioneers with a gavel. There's way more to Richie Brothers. Uh, they are an absolute mine of information. Um, if anybody is interested, go and check them out. You can find them online as always. Sorry to interrupt the guy with the funny glasses, but if you're enjoying this video, please hit the like button as it helps our channel. Or better still, share this video with a friend or a colleague. Thank you. Right, back to Beardy. 
Right, that pretty much wraps up the main part of this morning's show. As the show is probably indicating, I have places to be, uh, but I'm going to stick around in the chat for at least half an hour, I would have thought. I'm going to roll the outro in just a second before leaping gazelle-like over into that chat to see what you're all saying today. And if we can get to the bottom of who makes the best workwear boots, I'd love to hear from you. If you can't stick around for that, then please stay safe. Look after yourself, your family, your friends, and your colleagues and your boots as well. Have a great day, and thanks for watching. But if you do have the time and the inclination, I'll see you on the other side of this.